Good evening and, and welcome to everyone. Hey, this is the first of what will be two arable webinars. And uh, I, I am William Irving, Deputy President of the Ulster Farmers Union and, and the union in conjunction with Ulster Arable Society and Cafe are de delighted to host these two webinars. We have three great speakers lined up for you tonight, but before I introduce them, I, I just want to run over the housekeeping for, for tonight's webinar. A, the, the, the event tonight will be recorded and copies of, of this will be emailed to everyone tomorrow. A, all questions should be entered into the Q&A tab and after the three speakers have presented, we will, have, uh, we will put the questions to them and have a discussion. There, there will be a short survey at the end of the event and I would ask that you take a minute of your time to fill it in so, so that we can learn for future events. A basis on the ROSA points have been applied for in relation to these webinars. And if you wish to claim these points, please email your name and membership number to Ian Johnson at CAFRI. Ian's email address will be on, on tomorrow's email or that will go out to all attendees. A, the AHDB are carrying out a survey at present and have asked us to encourage all levy payers to, to register and help shape the future for cereals and oil seeds. Registration is quick and easy and all details can be found on the AHDB website. So that's, that's the housekeeping and now, now for the speakers. We have, we have three great speakers tonight. Gary Lanigan of Jugus, Michaela Tanner of Caffrey, and Simon Best, a horrible farmer from Queen's Pass. Our, our first speaker is Gary Lanigan. And Gary is principal researcher at Jugus. He leads the Greenhouse Gas Research Group at the Environment, Soils and Land Use Department at Johnstown's Castle. His main focus is measurement and modeling of ammonia and nitrous oxide emissions and carbon sequestration and the quantification of management strategies to reduce emissions and enhance sequestration. He is lead investigator of the Agricultural Research Initiative for Ireland, which involves Chugas and the main universities on the island, and is tasked with coordinating research in this area. In particular, he's extensively studied the optimization of land management to deliver sustainable intensification. He is a member of the UN expert panel on the mitigation of agricultural nitrogen, that advises the UN on ammonia abatement best practice and is an advisor of the EPS Climate Change Research Program. He is the author on the IPCC report on climate, land use and food security, and he is a, an adjunct professor at Galway and a Bay Fellow at Magdalen College, Cambridge. Gary, that, that, that's qu quite quite a <laughs> quite quite a list there so we're delighted to have you join us and we'll look forward to what you have to tell us tonight okay thanks very much william um so i'm going to share my screen now um and i shall get the right presentation from hold on just going to yeah okay now share screen Sorry. Sorry there, two seconds. I'll just close out some of the some of my PowerPoints. Should be it. Um, share screen and 
arbeid. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. So I will actually move straight on to the to the issue. So in terms of Ireland, Inc. Um, we have a bit of an issue and in, in fairness, our emissions profile and the emissions profile in Northern Ireland are very, very similar. And um, so agriculture comprises about one third of, green, of total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, however, the majority of those emissions uh, come from ruminant livestock. So from dairy and beef production and tillage emissions are actually very, very low. In fact, of the 22 million tonnes of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions that we produce from agriculture, about only about a million tonnes of them come from tillage, okay? Slightly more of them come from the land use, land use change, and forestry, the LUCF sector. But in, in general, the, the emissions coming from the tillage sector are very, very low. So that's, that's the good news. And the even better news is when you look at the carbon footprint of, of different products. So if you look at the carbon footprint of milk, it's roughly in Ireland, and it's very, very similar in Northern Ireland. It's almost exactly the same, in fact. Um, a kilo of milk produces about a kilo of greenhouse gas emissions, okay? The carbon footprint of beef, a little bit more uh, variable depending on your production system. So for suckler beef, it's somewhere between 16 and 20 kilos of, of CO2 uh, equivalents per kilo per kilo of meat. In the, in the case of dairy beef, it's probably half that value. It's somewhere around about eight to 10 kilos or so. Um, but if you look at cereals and if you look at the carbon footprint of cereals, the quantum is completely, uh, uh, it's a whole lot lower. You're talking about instead of a kilo of emissions per kilo of milk in the case of milk, um, it's in, in terms of, of grain, it's about 300 grams of emissions per kilo of grain produced. Okay, so, so, so it's, it's very, very much lower. And also the, the, the composition uh, of those emissions are very, very different. So if you look at milk and meat, uh, the, the, the emissions uh, profile is, is relatively similar. So the majority is uh, down to enteric fermentation in the case of milk, um, 40, about 46, 47 percent. Um, of emissions are cattle belching, uh, essentially, and in terms of meat, it's about 43%. Um, then you have, um, you know, the, 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 the next biggest item is, is manure management, so 17 and 18%. There's also then, for particularly if you have winter, winter finishing uh, beef animals, uh, there's quite a sizable uh, component associated with feed production. So in the case of uh, feed product for winter finishers, it's about 14.8%. So, so again, there's, it's, it's a, a, the majority, about 60% of the emissions are methane based. The, the majority of the remainder are N2O. If you look at, 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 at arable crops, be it um, cereals or potatoes or, or even vegetables or whatever, the majority of the emissions are nitrous oxide based emissions. And that's uh, nitrous oxide associated with fertilizer application or with um, uh, manure application, okay? So that dominates, uh, in fact, the system, okay? So, um, so you have the, 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 the two biggest issues are, are fertilizer and animal manures uh, going onto the system, okay? And um, also the, the, the the big difference um, with, with arable uh, systems and, and vegetables in general or uh, crops in general is 90% of the emissions uh, for milk and meat are on farm, somewhere between 80 and 90%. But in the case of, of, uh, of an arable system, it's really only about 70% of the emissions are occurring on farm, Six, somewhere between 50 to 70% of the emissions, depending on the crop, um, and depending on the system that you have, okay? Um, so you have a much larger proportion of the emissions that are post-processing or transport-related or consumer-related, 
Um, and in fact, again, with vegetables in particular, you've probably got a, a very large food waste um, uh, portion there. Okay, so, but the good news is that cereals and crops and vegetables in general, the, 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 the emissions are, are nearly an order of magnitude less than for animal products. Okay, so um, the other thing that you have, uh, um, certainly in the south of, in, in the Republic of Ireland, um, the N2O emissions on arable soils are quite low. Okay, so nitrous oxide emissions from, for, the, for the same amount of fertilizer that you put out on a grassland system, the emissions are higher than on an arable system. Now, why is that? So it's for two reasons. First of all, our arable soils tend to be on free draining, trafficable sandy soils. Um, but also then they, as a result, they have a very low, what we call denitrification capacity. So, so because they have a low amount of what we call denitrification, the, the conversion of nitrate to N2O or to N2, there's a low amount of N2O produced from arable systems. Also, um, these, these systems tend to be lower in carbon, which also reduces the N2O. And also they, they tend to have a, a much different microbiology. So, so um, uh, grassland systems are, tend to be fungal dominated and fungi can only produce N2O. Whereas in arable systems, they're bacteria dominated and they can actually denitrify to both N2O and dinitrogen, i.e. nitrogen gas that we is forms 80% of the atmosphere. Um, but of course, they also are very prone because they're, they tend to be free draining, they're prone to nitrate leaching. So if you look at our emission factor that we've measured um, for different fertilizers for calcium ammonium nitrate, urea, and urea plus MBPT, so we see a huge difference for calcium ammonium nitrate, urea, and urea plus um, a, a nitrification, or sorry, an ammonia inhibitor. Um, we see huge difference on grassland, but no statistical difference on cropland whatsoever. And that's simply down to, to the fact that cropland soils don't have a very high denitrification capacity. Okay, so how much carbon uh, can we sequester? So if you, if, you, if you look at where the main input of carbon is into the system, it's photosynthesis. CO2 gets taken up by the plant, the plant grows, it forms roots, and the, the, for a tillage system, uh, a typical spring barley crop, for example, will sequester about 10, 10 to 12 tonnes of carbon, not CO2, of carbon per hectare, which is equivalent to about 36 to 40 tonnes of CO2 per hectare. So that's, that's the, 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 the amount of photosynthesis that occurs. But then, of course, the, uh, the plant uh, breathes the same way we do, respires, and it releases CO2 in respiration. And that's somewhere around about four to five tons of, CO, of carbon per hectare. Um, and then you've got, you've got uh, sequestration in, in the different bits. But then you plow up the soil, of course, and you, uh, you, you can lose a lot of that carbon. But of course, if you straw incorporate, you can return a lot, of, a lot of the carbon that was captured during photosynthesis in the straw back into the soil. So straw incorporation, again, we see as one of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, the big methods to actually uh, reduce the carbon balance on the tillage system. Okay. The other thing that's very important um, about carbon sequestration is actually the soil type that you're on. So forget about management and keep management to the side. And um, if you think about, you, we always talk about a carbon sink. And in fact, a carbon sink is literally like that. It's a sink, right? So if you think of a, of a very sandy brown earth, for example, which would be very typical of our, um, of our tillage soils down in the Republic of Ireland, they're like a wash hand basin. They can't hold a whole lot of carbon, okay? So in fact, that's probably where you should actually prioritize your, your tillage is in the areas that, that can't actually store a whole lot of carbon. 
Um, if you think of, of, a, of, a, of a soil that has more loam or more silt or more clay in it, so that's a silty clay type glay sol or red zena or pod sol. And um, that's more like, a, you know, it's like a bath or a wash hand basin um, or a much bigger sink. OK, and then when you think about the peat soils, so the soils that are, are have more than 20 percent or soil organic carbon and um, they're like swimming pools. So they hold huge amounts of carbon. Um, and really, when we think about it, so the impact of soil type, you can see here, this is from a study we did looking at a range of different sites and a range of different uh, land uses. So we have brown earths, we have uh, pod sols, and we have glaze sols here. And, and what we see is that on the very sandy brown earths, it doesn't matter what your land use is, there's very little difference in the carbon content. Okay, whereas where you move to the higher clay, and silt content soils, you can see a big influence of management and land use. Okay, so croplands generally have the lowest soil carbon content, uh, forest, pasture, and rough grazing have higher soil carbon contents. But then again, it depends on your soil type. So if you're on a brown earth, in fact, there's, there's actually very little difference. Okay, so what can we do in a tillage system? to increase soil carbon. Well, the first thing we can do is introduce an external carbon source, manure. So AFB, for example, have been doing this uh, for, for a, a long number of years and have a very long long uh, term experiment going on. And they've, uh, they've quantified, um, and this is, this is research from Rothamsted. And you can see that as you increase the amount of either firm FYM or slurry going onto the system, you can very, very significantly increase the carbon content in an arable system. In fact, you can probably get it fairly analogous to a grassland system. So that, that, that tillage system and a grassland system is very, very close to each other. And, and the key thing is that by increasing soil organic matter and soil organic carbon, you're not just increasing uh, carbon for the sake of it, you're also increasing nutrient uh, utilization. So as you increase the organic matter in your soil, um, you improve the buffering capacity, you improve the, the water retention capacity of that soil, um, and you also improve the nutrient availability of that soil. So it's almost like uh, I always think of or, or, you know, carbon and organic matter as, as the hidden fertilizer. Um, again, strong cooperation, and this is, uh, again, uh, long-term data that we have from Oak Park in uh, County Carlow. And what we see is that for different levels of strong cooperation, um, we, get, we get much higher levels of, uh, of soil organic carbon. And we estimate somewhere around about, in terms of the, uh, the, the total carbon you add to the field, somewhere between 10 and 20% of it remains in the soil. Um, and, 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 and the important thing is that the, the precursor and the early warning system that we have for soil organic carbon and for carbon sequestration improving is that microbial activity increases. So we, we see that microbial activity, once you in, in introduce a strong corporation and also cover crops, is that you get a, a, a 40 to 60 percent increase in microbial activity and microbial biomass. OK, and that for us. Uh, serves as the early warning system that soil carbon is going in the right direction. Okay, so again, the use of legumes, of course, can then uh, uh, reduce the amount of mineral fertilizer uh, that you have. So, um, and uh, particularly if you, uh, for example, have a legume cover crop and can then incorporate it into the soil. So, so again, that will improve, improve the system. And then you have minimum tillage. And minimum tillage, there's been a lot of debate about it between, and there's, there's loads of definitions as to whether it's non-inversion tillage, if it's true minimum tillage, or if it's no-till. Um, what we, what we, we, and we've done about 10 years, 10 to 15 years of research down in Oak Park and Carlow on this. And what we see is that minimum tillage 
is very good for improving, improving some of the fundamentals like microbial activity and number of earthworms, etc. What it tends to do is to increase the soil carbon um, in the top 10 centimeters. But actually, when you actually um, look at the, the soil carbon across the whole 30 to 40 centimeters, the whole plow layer, um, in fact, there's very little difference. So, so minimum tillage does um, have a role to play uh, in soil structure, in water holding capacity, um, but not necessarily in carbon sequestration. And in fact, if you get compaction of those min till soils, it can in fact increase your nitrous oxide emissions. And then we have other things that you can do, other features that you can introduce into your arable farm. And these are things like hedgerows, for example, um, or uh, woodlands or woodland, wood riparian strips, okay, uh, to intercept nitrogen uh, from runoff, etc. Okay. And, and what we find, we're, we're doing a project on this at the moment down in Chagas, is that highly managed. Um, Highly managed uh, uh, hedges don't sequester a huge amount of carbon. They do sequester about somewhere around about 0.2 to 0.5 tons of CO2 per, per kilometer. But if you allow those hedges to grow out a meter and grow up by a couple of meters, you can substantially increase the amount of sequestration both in the, in the actual woody biomass and also in the soil. So actually not managing your hedgerows and not keeping them nice and trim is a good thing. Um, and then if you can put in woodland features such as riparian buffer strips um, to water courses to clean your, your water as it, as it runs off um, or to intercept ammonia, um, particularly in the case of, of, of livestock farming, um, again, these are, uh, are, 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 are really useful. Uh, both in terms of pro providing uh, carbon sequestration, but also in, in terms of providing biodiversity corridors. So can you make a tillage farm carbon neutral? And the answer is actually, yes, you can. And, and with not a huge amount of effort. So if you look at the our typical Irish uh, 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 tillage farm, um, we have uh, somewhere around about uh, 300 tonnes of CO2 equivalents coming from, from fertiliser. Um, if you do a full life cycle analysis, about the same amount comes from the manufacturer of fertiliser. Um, you have the emissions associated with, with herbicide and pesticide uh, uh, production, and, and then also the energy associated with grain drying if you're drying on farm. And so the total emissions are somewhere around about 800 tonnes of CO2. Um, uh, uh, equivalent, okay. Um, however, um, if you introduce cover crops, if you introduce strong corporation, um, and if you can change your fertilizer type, you can you, you can get reductions. And um, there, you can probably get reductions somewhere in the region of about uh, thirty percent or so. And then, um, if you Im improve your hedgerow management. Uh, you can get a substantial reduction. And then if you also improve or, or increase the amount of, of broadleaf, if you put a hectare of forestry in there, for example, or you put a tree line, um, you, can, you can very, very quickly get the emissions down to uh, carbon neutral. So, so in terms of a pathway for arable farms to get to carbon neutrality, it's actually, it's actually not overly difficult it's certainly nowhere near as difficult as on, on, on uh, livestock farms. Um, and in fact, the first things I always say to my tillage farmers, they always ask me, how can I improve the carbon footprint? And I would always say the first thing is get rid of the couple of animals you might have. So that, that, that will actually do the first, the, 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 the best bit going forward. But then after that, then it's, it's around land management and also landscape management and where you are in that landscape is actually quite important in the context of what you're doing. So if you're near to a water course, then it's going to make sense to, to, to have a woody riparian strip. If you're not, then maybe it won't, okay? But it depends whether then you have animal livestock or not, and then you might want trees to do, to do other things, you know? And, and, and of course we do have 
uh, coming up. We have the, the whole uh, uh, silver pasture, silver pastoral systems um, that can, can both improve carbon sequestration within systems, um, but also reduce emissions as well. So um, with that, actually, um, my summary is that, yes, absolutely for tillage systems, SOC is important for maintaining both soil quality and maintaining yield. Um, there are several measures, such as rotations, strong corporation cover crops, grass lays that are effective in increasing soil organic carbon, minimum tillage less so, I would say. Um, sequestration doesn't last forever as well and is, is reversible. And that including things like woodlands and hedgerows can help achieve a carbon neutral arable farm. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Gary. That, that was excellent and very positive. So I'm sure it will generate a lot of questions. Okay, and, and just on that, anybody with questions, please enter them in, in the Q&A box on, on your uh, tablet or computer. Uh, our, our next speaker is Michaela Tanner. Uh, Michaela is a technologist working with, in Caffrey's Sustainable Land manage, Management Branch with a focus on land management and specifically carbon. Michaela has a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Technology and a Master of Science in Business and Agri-Food and Rural Enterprise Innovation Management from Queen's University, Belfast. Since joining CAFRI in 2020, Michaela has been involved in coordination and calculation of the CAFRI farm carbon footprint and identifying opportunities for carbon reduction on the campus farms. She has also been involved in the setup of carbon benchmarking program for environmental BDGs, demonstrating the use of carbon calculators as to tools. Sorry, I've lost my place here. I, on campus farms, she has also been involved in the setup of the benchmarking program and use of carbon calculators as a tool to manage carbon within the farm business. Michaela is a com commended member of the Institute of Agriculture Management. Michaela, we we'll, we'll look for forward to hearing what you have to tell us tonight. Thanks very much, William. And just confirm you can see that there, William. Yes, that's great. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so good evening, everybody, and thanks very much to the organisers for asking me to speak this evening. Um, as William says, my name is Michaela Tanner, and as he said, I work within the Sustainable Land Management Branch at CAFRI. So within the Sustainable Land Management Branch, we focus on investigating and demonstrating technology projects um, in, key, in the key areas of air quality, water quality, biodiversity and land management. And hence, we're talking about carbon this evening. Um, so I'm going to focus on measuring carbon within the farm and the use of carbon calculators um, and highlight some of the ones that are available out there and the work that we've done at CAFRI to date um, and how that has maybe been used and developed in some of the other talks that will happen um, going forward, especially with Simon's involvement in the in an innovation partner, or European Innovation Partnership. Um, so as William said, we're looking at increasing the understanding and knowledge of our farmers within the business development group um, program relating to carbon and calculation of carbon footprints on their farms. Um, so as some of you may be aware, or just I suppose to summarize, CAFRI is made up of three farm centers. Um, firstly, the Lowland Dairy Centre, which is 190 hectares in total, of which 50 hectares or approximately 50 hectares um, would be in arable or uh, potatoes. And we also have a small area of arable crops within our Lowland Beef Centre. Um, a very important point within CAFRI and within the CAFRI farms is obviously um, our leaf accreditation, so linking the environment and farming. And obviously a focus on carbon is becoming very strong within that um, accreditation scheme. So obviously a very important and uh, topical subject to discuss this evening. So as Gary's pointed out, um, there's a number of different options in terms of where our emissions come from within a, an arable sector or crop sector. And many of these occur before the farm gate. And we appreciate that that's um, sometimes a challenge in terms of 
what we can do to manage our emissions on the farm. But it is still important to take a moment to pause and think in order to investigate and highlight those areas of emission on your farm um, in order to help develop your, your business more sustainably in the form of considering your carbon footprint. So basically, what is it? You know, it's important that we all have the same level of understanding in terms of, of what the terminology is out there. So why is it important and what does it stand for? Well, a carbon footprint, according to the Carbon Trust, is a measure of the total greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions caused by an individual, organisation, service or product within a given year expressed as a carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2e. And Gary has quite rightly already pointed out the level of emissions within an arable sector compared to our um, counterparts in the livestock business. And it's generally broken down into a per product of farm output. Um, so why do we, why should we uh, do our carbon footprint and, and why is it important? Well, as I said, and as, as Gary's previously highlighted, understanding that source of emission on your farm is very important and will vary from farm to farm, especially if you're within a mixed farming enterprise. Um, you may find a significant shift depending on the makeup of your business. Within that then, we can look to consider how can we manage our farms with carbon in mind in order to develop our farms more sustainably, both from an environmental perspective, but also then consider any changes we may make from a financial perspective. There's also then the opportunity um, to market products, or you may be asked by your uh, food supply chains and supply chains that you're involved in to carry out carbon footprint as part of that um, contract service. But ultimately, the overall aim of doing a carbon footprint is in order to reduce our carbon emissions, in order to slow that rate of climate change. And ultimately, as farmers, and especially within the arable sector, we're very aware of the impact that climate change can have on our businesses. Um, and we need to be able to uh, make changes and demonstrate how those changes are um, reducing the, that impact of agriculture within, within Northern Ireland. So a carbon footprint is a tool to identify of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's very important to look at that when looking um, at your, your farm business plan. So in terms of technology out there and um, the availability of technology, there is a number of carbon calculators available and a carbon calculator um, can come in many forms in the form of uh, an Excel sheet or an online system. Within CAFRI, we looked at reviewing numerous carbon calculators out there um, and set a very specific criteria in order to select a calculator to best suit the CAFRI program's work um, funded through the Rural Development Program. Initially, that was the Environmental Business Development Groups and um, following on from that then has rolled out to the wider business development group network. So in order to select calculators, we set a very specific criteria. The first obviously being that it had to be um, developed based on sound scientific research. It had to be comprehensive in the fact that it covered a range of farming systems and enterprise mixes within um, the, the system and obviously very applicable within potentially a mixed arable farm system um, or mixed cropping system. And essentially then it had to be practical to use on farm so that farmers could easily collect this information within their existing um, farm systems and then be available to be used by farmers potentially outside the CAFRI program should they so wish. So following on from that, then we obviously wanted to make sure that calculator that we would select conform to um, accredited international agreed methodologies set out by the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, the tier two part of this basically means um, that it is more localized figure so at a minimum representing European level uh, emission factors and potentially some UK specific factors in there and also then be PAS 2050 accredited, which is a British standard 
um, available to carbon calculators or to calculators out there to calculate carbon footprints. And finally, then the output of the report to look at um, emissions on a whole farm basis, because many policies and targets potentially could go down that line going forward, or also as part of accreditation schemes, as I mentioned before, and also then per enterprise, so that we can look at specifically where emissions come from within um, a mixed farming enterprise or a mixed cropping enterprise. And um, ultimately, uh, the final um, point we were looking for was independent validation, just to ensure that the data that was being entered could then be checked independently to make sure that there was no data errors and that the report we were getting back was meaningful and could be interpreted um, to, to make changes on the farm. So from that then, um, we reviewed a number of different carbon calculators. Um, from a quick search online, there was at least 64 carbon calculators identified as potentials. Um, following that, uh, a further nine were reviewed in more detail. And upon that, then we looked at the level of um, uh, information available out there on transparency of where emission factors came from. And following on, we selected our carbon calculator for the CAFRI programs, which was selected to be AgriCalc. There is other carbon calculators out there, and they may be more suited for um, your specific enterprise makeup or your business. But it's important to note just if you're using a carbon calculator to compare your figures with somebody who's um, calculated it using the same calculator so that you're comparing apples with apples. Because if you compare um, from one calculator to another, you're not comparing directly. So it may just um, throw an error in there or it uh, can allow um, incorrect interpretation of results. So obviously within the CAFRI program, um, we took this a step further um, on the CAFRI farms and basically used the information we had from our carbon calculators to calculate our carbon emissions, which is what most of the calculators focus on. There are some of the calculators that include some of the sequestration that Gary has highlighted. Um, and as that science is developed and is rolled out further, the calculators um, we would expect would include more of that information. But at this stage, the majority don't. And in order to get our farm balances for the CAFRI farms, we applied another piece of um, technology in the form of LIDAR, which is light ranging and um, detection uh, technology, which is basically an airplane and a laser measurement of above ground biomass in the form of trees and hedgerows. And then we also took um, more detailed soil analysis looking at our soy carbon stocks. Um, and these technologies are also demonstrated um, in Simon's uh, program in terms of the ARC Zero. And they, he'll hopefully be able to go into a wee bit more detail in the outcomes of those. But quickly, just to sort of highlight the information needed to calculate a carbon footprint, this would include a number of inputs on the farm. Obviously, for an arable enterprise, mainly driven by fertilizer and any imported organic manures, and then any crop protection products, fuel use, or electricity needed for that enterprise. There's other information in terms of land use, so um, tillage potentially uh, practices should it be full till, no till, or min till, um, and then the level or the total amounts of those um, inputs recorded as well as then any farm outputs, so products sold off the farm to give you your total farm breakdown. There is also, um, for anybody with mixed enterprises, there's areas then to consider in terms of livestock management and numbers and things like that. But after um, this information is then collected, then we get a number of outputs from our carbon calculators. And firstly, um, this very detailed table is just an example of some of the information that we can get within the calculator that we use within the CAFRI programs. Um, Gary has also highlighted then per kilogram or per ton um, of product, and that is detailed it also, but it um, wouldn't all fit on the screen. So as you can see, there's an awful lot of information we can get out of a carbon calculator. And 
Following this, then we can also take this information and produce a number of charts summarizing um, the areas of emissions as, as Gary has highlighted previously. So as we can see, and just to reinforce those points, the main emissions occur from um, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And in this case, there was no imported organic manures and that's why there's no methane um, attributed here. And obviously the main percentage of emissions coming from manure and fertilizer um, with many of those emissions, unfortunately being embedded and occurring before the farm gate. But ultimately, within CAFRI, um, we're looking at rolling out that carbon footprinting process through the wider business development group network. And for anybody that's in, within a CAFRI business development group, if you speak with your advisor, you are eligible to complete this alongside your traditional physical and financial benchmarking. And if you complete physical and financial benchmarking, there is only about a 70 to 80% top up. Um, and the information required to complete a carbon footprint. Following that then, um, you would get your support assistant to enter that information. It's reviewed internally by members of staff at CAFRI. It's submitted externally for validation to AgriCalc. Following completion of that validation process, your individual advisor will come back and speak to you um, regarding the opportunities to reduce emissions on your farm. If you're within more than one business development group, for example, maybe an arable and a beef finishing group, there would be conversation and coordination between those two um, advisors to ensure that you're going to get the best um, use of that information that has been produced. But the main areas that the advisors will look at in terms of mitigation will be nutrient use efficiency, livestock management, land management, and energy use and energy efficiency. Following on from that then, um, the farmer or farms may take action from this in the form of a carbon management strategy, or it may just be an opportunity to reevaluate maybe in uh, two years time, um, should any other actions be already undertaken um, at this stage. There is obviously a number of areas in terms of uh, new research and the potential for future carbon mitigation as well, including uh, genomics, uh, feed additives, stir additives, renewables and hydrogen vehicles, all massive potential. And hopefully those new technologies will also be included in the um, uh, calculators as they are evolving going forward. Um, finally, then I just want to summarize with, it's very important that we start our journey now to understand where we are um, in terms of carbon emissions, especially firstly by measuring what our carbon footprint is, understanding sources of emission on farms that we can manage them. And then ultimately, whenever we get that technology to a stage where it's easily available and adoptable, get that net carbon balance in terms of measuring our soil carbon stocks and our sequestration from our hedgerows and other uh, above ground biomass. So that's me, William. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela. That was excellent, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll st stimulate the debate uh, at, at the end. Uh, the, the, the next speaker now uh, is Simon Best. Simon runs the Acton House Farm in County Armagh, producing cereal, oilseed, rape and beans, the majority of which are sold within a radius of five miles of the farm. Over the past 20 years, there's been a significant focus on environmental sustainability, with the farm being engaged in environment stewardship schemes and becoming LEAF accredited. Simon is currently participating farmer in the ARC Zero project, with the aim of establishing a verifiable carbon baseline for the farm. This year, Simon was winner of the Farmers Weekly Harbour Farmer of the Year Award, and the speaker at the Oxford Farming Conference. Simon, we're delighted to have, have you with us and look forward to what, what you have to tell us. Thank you, William. I'll just share the yep. screen. Hopefully you can see it there, okay? Yes, it's come, come, come on now, that's you. Great, great.
Are you okay? Okay. Yep. That's just now. Um, yep. Thanks very much, William. Uh, so this evening, uh, I want to give you an overview of the Arc Zero EIP project that, that I've been participating in as as one of seven farmers. Um, Arc Zero or Accelerate Women Carbon. Um, and although we have a beef enterprise here at Acton, uh, we are mainly um, an arable unit. Um, for me, the project has been an opportunity to determine, uh, as you've said, what a verifiable, uh, transparent baseline for carbon uh, on our farm looks like and how we can set out to improve this uh, over time. Uh, the Arc Zero project aims to do this uh, by empowering farmers with their gross emissions, sequestration and net carbon position, um, soil fertility um, and soil analysis, uh, nutrient and pesticide runoff maps. Um, and from that, uh, you see that we have a, a wide geographical spread um, across the seven farms involved in the project, as well as a widespread of enterprises and, and soil types. Um, obviously, as farmers, uh, we have to deliver on a number of levels, uh, not simply net zero. Um, we've got a production of nutritious um, food and tackling malnutrition, uh, delivering soil improvement, both fertility and health, uh, accelerating carbon sequestration above ground and below ground, uh, which we hear a bit more about later, um, improving water quality, reducing overland flow, uh, optimizing biodiversity, and managing our landscape and heritage. So therefore, it's, it's, it's not one single lens through which we can view uh, farm performance um, when it comes to, uh, comes to carbon. Um, in Arc Zero, <coughs> we've been really fortunate to be able to lean on some of the outstanding work that's been carried out by Devonish uh, at their Douth project in Mead. Uh, the key principle being, if you can't measure it, uh, you can't manage it. And farming and food production needs to be benchmarked on net and not gross emissions to get real farmer buy-in uh, to positive change. And this means we not only look at what we emit in our production activities or, or greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also what our natural environment and soils sequester to give us that net position. Uh, this will give us real transparency on where we are and what we need to do in the future. Um, many of you will be aware of the term LIDAR uh, following recent announcements on soil health schemes, etc. Um, but it's essentially a 3D view of our landscape, uh, allowing us to measure above ground biomass uh, on, on farms. Um, but uh, as I'll touch on that later, um, it, it allows us to identify um, overflow, uh, land overflow uh, of water also. Um, this is uh, an example of some of the detail uh, that a LIDAR survey can produce. Um, this is a wrath um, on, on our farm. It's um, been here for an awfully long time, and it's just fascinating to see uh, how this man made feature dating from around 350 AD can be brought back into life and just some of the details um, that, 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 that LIDAR can sort of uncover in the landscape around us, not just in our biomass and our hedges and our trees, but also in our built heritage. So in terms of, of the process, uh, we as a group started uh, back in February with uh, full soil analysis of the entire farm uh, in two and a half hectare blocks uh, using 25 cores uh, per block. Uh, each was GPS marked for, for future consistency so that we can make it repeat re repeatable in the future. Um, in terms of the first block of analysis, it was fairly standard in terms of phosphate, potash, pH and, and probably most importantly organic matter. Um, this map uh, showing pH uh, was produced by Rachel Cassidy at AFPI and you know we as a group are very grateful of her and AFPI's input um, so uh, as to be able to see the results overlaid in a map um, such as this is particularly powerful um, from, from a management perspective but and despite carrying out regular soil analysis um, for me consistency that, that we have uh, in, in pH um, and also here in, in terms of phosphate um, and you can see the the, um, the indices up the side we're, we're sort of in around that um, P3 index which is where we, we aim to be. Um, 
This map uh, was produced by overlaying uh, soil analysis uh, and LIDAR results um, to give a, a runoff risk map. Um, this is, I suppose, a secondary benefit of, of the information that's generated from a LIDAR survey. Uh, the yellow lines that you'll see here uh, identify runoff sensitive areas. So, for example, where, where water will flow um, across the ground during heavy rainfall. Um, we also see sort of ditches and shucks around here as well. And, and you can see with the, with the blue lines, uh, these water bodies um, where, where the, the flow will, will run into. Um, the red lines here, which are, which are probably less prominent, um, th th these show the areas that, that um, also have a, a higher phosphate level uh, as picked up from our soil analysis results. So it's, uh, it's higher phosphate on the areas that are, that are uh, high, high, um, runoff sensitive. So um, I suppose the purpose of these maps um, are to identify areas where we could or perhaps should intervene in the event of unfavorable weather, for example, limiting slurry application, fertilizer spreading, or, or, or pesticide use. Um, but they could also be used to help identify areas where further in interventions could, could have maximum impact, such as trees or environmental habitats or repairing buffered strips. Um, so a really useful management tool um, going forward also. The next step in the project uh, was for all the farmers to go through a carbon calculator and um, Michael has outlined um, a, a number of areas around selecting carbon calculators. Uh, the AgriCalc tool um, from SRUC was used uh, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the fact that it breaks the farm down into individual enterprises, um, certainly very helpful to understand where impacts um, could be made. Um, it also splits uh, the greenhouse gas emissions into three categories. Uh, this one's showing carbon dioxide, um, but also we have methane here, uh, the entire methane from, from our beef and oxide as well. So allows us to really see all three greenhouse gases um, in, in their individual states and, and what impacts they have, I suppose, on the farm. This then gives us an overall gross farm emission. Um, and you'll see that micro emission is calculated at almost 1,500 tonnes of, of carbon dioxide um, equivalent. Um, and this can be viewed by any individual enterprise um, also to see what, where, um, which has the main impact and, and in what respect. Um, another uh, advantage of AgriCalc uh, is that it has developed a, a carbon sequestration module, which calculates the, the carbon sequestered by forestry, you know, our trees and our hedges, but also sequestered by the soil um, by way of slurry and organic manures, um, as you can see here. Um, this therefore gives us a net greenhouse gas emission for the whole farm, which you'll see in my case is 50% is roughly of the, of the gross figure. Um, um, and which is most often reported. Uh, AgriCalc do give a health warning um, in that they only use tier one sequestration factors for organic manures. Um, and tier one, um, as, as you heard earlier, tier one is essentially where global data is used uh, for assumptions. Tier two is really into sort of European or, or UK more regional assumptions. And clearly, this is a big knowledge gap. You know, how, how do we get precision into what carbon stocks are on farm and, and how management interventions can influence positive change? Um, in that respect. So the more we can do to, to bring our, our factor into tier one or even, or sorry, into tier two or even tier three, which would be on farm, uh, the better uh, the results and the, the understanding we have. So progressing on from what I suppose was, was an annual emission data, uh, the next area that, that, that the project investigated was to look at on farm carbon stocks. So what is held over time? Soils, uh, trees and hedges. And you'll see here that, that we wanted to look into what impact management decisions of the past 15 to 20 years have had on these stocks and, and then be able to perhaps apply these to baselines um, for moving forward. Uh, so using the organic matter from the original soil analysis, uh, we were able to divide each land use by asking sort of the following questions. So um, organic matter, was it not to 10%, was it 10 to 20%? 20 to 30, et cetera. 
um, what was the land use? Um, was it grass, arable, woodland? Um, whether organic manures have been applied, slurry, farmyard manure, or compost? And in the case of grassland, is it permanent pasture? Is it rotational grass? Is it cut, grazed, or both? Um, and if it's rotational, is it predominantly ryegrass or are there multi species swords involved? And when it comes to woodland, is it deciduous, coniferous, uh, short, short rotation willow, or perhaps some silver, silver pasture agroforestry? And you'll see in this slide that, that in my case, uh, we had 16 different land use uh, and management categories. However, the majority of, the, of these uh, were in two um, arable categories. Um, the majority of the land um, that was less than 10% organic matter and 10 to 20% organic matter. And this really helped to bring some consistency uh, to, to the results. Um, it was also important uh, to ensure that soil type and texture classification was consistent. Um, and from the original analysis results, the majority of our soils comprised of of clay or heavy loam clay, if you take sort of seventy percent and another twenty percent, and as Gary touched on earlier, um, clays, uh, fortunately probably for us, have a larger potential for long-term sequestration. So, in order to accur accurately assess soil carbon, uh, it's necessary to sample to thirty centimeters. Um, the normal standard analysis is generally about seven and a half centimeters, so it does take um, a bit more work, a bit do more work. Um, and, and in the project, uh, we commissioned an independent uh, sampling provider uh, to carry out all the soil analysis, really to ensure that we had a robust and credible, credible process throughout that we could come back and, and stand behind um, in, in the future when, when, we, when we took these results forward. So RPS did a, did a really good job in there. And, and as I say, it, it did take quite a lot of effort to, to take the samples across all seven farms. Now, it should be said that, that, that this data uh, is only recently completed. Uh, however, some of the results from an arable perspective, and as we've been hearing earlier, um, are really interesting. Um, looking at the, the top 30 centimetres, um, in this case, uh, soil is below 10% uh, organic matter. There definitely appears to be a trend towards higher carbon in arable land uh, compared to grassland. 3.75% 3, 3 average carbon uh, in our grassland of the same organic matter uh, versus 4.3% carbon um, in our arable land in that, in that top 30 centimetres. The same trend uh, has, um, is apparent in, in the 10 to 20% organic matter soils that we have, uh, where we've got 4.3% carbon in grassland, 56 uh, in arable, so obviously higher in a higher organic matter scenario, but again, that trend of, of the arable land uh, in that 30 centimeter um, um, area being, being higher. And it also appears that, that arable land um, is more evenly distributed uh, throughout that 30 centimeters. Um, as you'll see here, uh, sort of 5.9 to 5.6, um, a, a bit more inconsistent through the, through the grass. Uh, land and you know perhaps to do with plowing or deeper rooting, uh, different rotations, um, just just hard to know application of organic matter. Um, but another one to sort of um, to follow up on on the back of some of the the results that we've got. So looking again at lidar and, and this time at, at our trees and hedges and this map um, again prepared by Alex Higgins at AFP uh, clearly identifies. Um, vegetation height from which we can then calculate the amount of carbon contained in the above ground biomass on farm. Um, the colour scale shows the heights of individual features um, and can also inform where improvements could be made such as additional hedgerows or, or more trees, parking trees, etc. And this table really breaks that down a bit further, uh, showing the carbon contained in each category of hedge. Um, obviously, the taller and more dense the hedge, the greater the percentage carbon. You can see that on our farm, almost 2,000 tonnes of carbon is stored in, in trees and hedges alone. Um, if I then alter man management, um, such as widening or allowing hedges to grow taller, or planting new hedges or trees, using LIDAR, I'll, I'll then be able to assess the impact of this in carbon stocks in the future. 
So to summarize, uh, we now know, you know above ground, our trees and our hedges, as well as our below ground soil carbon. Uh, the top 30 centimeters of my soil contains 65,000 tons of carbon. And if you add in the 1,700 approximately tons of, uh, that we have from our trees and hedges, uh, we have a total carbon stock of, of around 66,000 tons of carbon, um, or more correctly, uh, 244,000 tons of, of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and we as farmers are therefore custodians of an awful lot of carbon, um, and I don't think this is given anywhere near the credit that it's due, um, and despite the fact that we are one of the only industries that can genuinely sequester carbon, we're often held up as a, as a scapegoat. So the importance of this work is it, 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 it really um, brought to bear when it comes to that fact. So I want to just bring you back to AgriCalc for, for the last couple of minutes, um, just to touch on, on some of the opportunities, I suppose, to improve or, or mitigate over time. And it is the intention of, of the group to revisit and replicate the process, hopefully, in in three to five years uh, to determine the success of management intervention uh, on the, in that intervening period. Um, and you'll see that AgriCalc provide a, a summary of areas where opportunity exists, um, this, this matrix of sort of medium and uh, low and potentially high um, mitigation opportunities. Um, and the fact there are quite, quite a number of lows there um, means that a lot of the low hanging fruit uh, has already been used in, in, in my case. For example, uh, IPM or, or consistent pHs across the farm or, 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 or phosphate consistency. Um, however, you'll see that, that, that this table that um, at the, uh, below here, that, that fertilizer is, is by far the largest uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions on, on our farm. So it begs the question, I guess, you know, could we reduce our fertilizer usage? Um, this, uh, as, you, as you'd all agree, is, is a great year to find out. Um, in my case, a 30% reduction in fertilizer use would equate to approximately 25% reduction in, in net farm emission, in greenhouse gas emissions. So significant, um, as, as well as, the, as obviously the, 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 the cost um, impact there as well. Targeted applications uh, underpinned by analysis, you know, soil, soil analysis being consistent and diligent there, uh, leaf analysis, um, targeting what the crop needs, uh, and then green analysis to see uh, how, the, how the crop has performed throughout the year. It is protected urea an option, for example, to reduce nitrous oxide emissions. And we've heard earlier about, about cover crops and the potential to increase organic matter, but also contributing, you know, up to, up to 40 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, um, tying in with that reduction in fertilizer use. Rotation, um, I, I grow beans as, as I've spoken about many times. Uh, there are very low greenhouse, the very low greenhouse gas emissions, and you know, could this, um, you know, ca carbon offset be reflected in the, in the carbon value of, of the end user? Also, could we could we have a greater value for for some low emission? crops that we could grow. And finally, pH, and, and with only 18% of soils in Northern Ireland being at optimum fertility, the correct pH not only improves productivity and efficiency in nutrient use, but also soil biodiversity. When pH is low or suboptimal, biological activity slows, and that soil can, can then end up becoming a greenhouse gas emitter. So finally, um, accelerating agriculture carbon to, to, to zero will only be achieved by making the, the agenda relevant. So personalizing the journey, which is what we're really striving to achieve in Arc Zero, uh, being transparent and creating baselines uh, of carbon stocks and segregation, not just emissions. Um, and hopefully you'll see the potential that, that this data uh, gives to particularly that discussion. And um, education, explaining how use of new digital data um, and not and, and not being afraid of it and, and some of the uh, potential that we have through LIDAR and, and, and wider soil analysis. Empowering farmers so using new personalized knowledge uh, to make better quality decisions. And then repeating the baselines, assessing management intervention and understanding how we can innovate further to accelerate the journey to net zero over time. Um, so on that, uh, I'll finish up. Thanks for your time. Um, 
uh, hope, hopefully you can see some of the positive progress uh, that has been made through this project. It's certainly been very enlightening for me and the work that, that we will be doing uh, as a project over the final year uh, to really understand and verify the baseline um, for each farmer on that journey. So over to you, William. Thank you, Simon. That, that was amazing. Uh, the, the amount of information you have gained through your involvement in the art era with the, the map on and the LIDAR and the, and the 30 centimetre uh, soil samples. Uh, it's a huge amount of information which has to be, has to be useful. So, uh, folks, that, that's our three speakers and we'll have a, a box full of questions here in our chat and uh, I'm going to attempt to put these questions to our, to our, our guests here and uh, we'll hopefully have a good discussion. Uh, the, the, the first question is to, to Gary and uh, it's asking what size of enterprise are these carbon footprint values for and how do they compare to Irish or Northern Irish farm farm size? They're for, they're for any size enterprise. So 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 most Irish and Northern Irish enterprises, be they tillage, livestock, or dairy based, are fairly analogous to each other. There's probably a little bit more uh, housing done in terms of um, uh, livestock and, and and dairy up 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 north than there is down down in our jurisdiction. But in, in terms of, certainly in terms of tillage production, there's very, very little difference, I would say. So, so the, the only difference would be that our soil types are probably a lot more free draining and trafficable than they might be up north. Um, but, and, and, and actually that in, in, in terms actually is, is actually a bad issue in terms of carbon sequestration because we can sequester in those carbon soils, uh, those low, those sandy soils, we can sequester less carbon. So actually you're probably on a, at an advantage uh, uh, north of the border there when it comes to tillage farms. Yep. Th thank you for that. A, the next question, is, I suppose you could all have a view on this one, and it's asking, should carbon footprint not sit with the end consumer rather than the farmers? Uh, Guy, do you want to lead off? And we'll yeah, go. we get that a lot. So, so should it be consumer based or should it be consumer based? Um, so, the the way the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, view it, it's based on who who uses that the, that 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 greenhouse gas. So, in 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 the case of 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 agriculture, the farmers produce those greenhouse gases. In the case of, of uh, fuel consumption, the Saudi Arabia actually has very low uh, carbon emissions because they produce the fuel, but they're not the ones who burn it. So, so, so in fact, it's, it's, so it's, the, it's the point of obligation, as we call it, the person who produces the greenhouse gases. In the case of agriculture, it's the producer. In the case of Fossil fuel, it's a consumer. So, so you could you could see that as a as a system that is actually stacked against agriculture, in, in that we produce um, the food, but we're not the ones consuming it. And and you could in in you know quite rightly say the consumer should pay. Um, uh, but but at the same time, you know, they are the rules of the game, and um, and 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 that's what we have to do. In, in within those rules, tillage actually comes out quite favourably. Thank you, Gary. Michaela, do you want to comment? Just to add to that, as Gary's pointed out earlier, obviously with a tillage system, there's massive opportunity, you know, to sequester carbon that other industries don't have, and that's something that we should just be mindful of. That we're talking about. Um, like total emissions, not net emissions um, within those sort of figures. And net emissions generally come out in a tillage enterprise better than, than corresponding other enterprises. Yeah, and, and that's, for me, that's why I love looking. I, I like researching tillage systems because there's much more I can do in the tillage system than I can do in the grassland system to, to change the carbon balance of the system. As a humble livestock farmer, I'm not having a great night here, I think. 
Hey, Simon, do you want to comment on that? I think the only thing I would, would say, I suppose, to, to follow that on, yes, we, we, we have to take the, the emissions, but, but we need to make sure that we keep control of any of the, 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 the carbon that we have on farm and that we don't, we don't give away, I suppose, any, any potential that we have. And when you look at the amount of carbon stocks um, that many of our farms will have, I think making sure that we understand that and, and that, that we we keep control of that for the future is, is probably the most important thing. And I think that's a very, sorry, that's a very good point. So, so farmers are also, they're not only uh, emitters of CO2, they're curators of carbon. Yeah. So, so particularly in Irish farms, um, a lot of our farms have very high soil organic carbon levels, far, far higher than, than in other bits of Europe. Okay. And, and in fact, we, the, the, like farmers north and south of the border, need to be paid the proper price of carbon, I would say, to, to actually, uh, you know, to, to actually create that carbon. You are literally carbon. They talk about carbon farming. And that's what you are doing. You are actually, actually managing your system to keep that carbon in the system. And um, our, our problem in Ireland isn't sequestering more carbon necessarily it's keeping all the carbon we have in there in the system because we've got so much carbon in the system already yep Th th thank you for that hey, the, the next the next question is back back to you gary and it's asking what size broadleaf forest are you counting on to to reduce the carbon by the 89 ton oh, on the, well on the, on the 100 that, hectare that, that depends on the size of your farm i would say so, so i, I so, will it's, it's, it's referring to this 100 hectare tillage farm yeah yeah so so you're probably putting in about seven eight hectares of broadleaf so so the thing about broadleaf uh, uh, um, uh, you know, farming sequestration in terms of forestry, it, it, it sequesters less per year, but over the entire lifetime of that forest. So a, a conifer forest is in for about 40 years. A broadleaf forest is in for about 80 to 120 years, right? So over the lifetime of that forest, a broadleaf will sequ a, sequester more, but B, deliver you far more in terms of biodiversity. So uh, and also in terms of soil quality, yeah. So if you put in a, in a, in a Sitka spruce plantation, yes, it sequesters a lot of carbon very quickly. And for, from that point of view, it's very good, but it A, acidifies the soil, and B, um, you, you have issues in terms maybe of water quality, and, and, and you certainly have huge issues in terms of biodiversity. So it depends on what you want that forestry to do. Is it to sequester carbon or is it to, to, to deliver multiple benefits? Yeah. But if I was to pl plant a, a native a species woodland today, like a, how many years would it be before it would be like an, a sequester and a significant... Oh, well, now, no, if you're, if you're putting in broadleaf, it'll be losing carbon for probably the first five years or so, and then it'll slowly, very, very slowly gain carbon. Um, and the rate, so, so over in, in a conifer system, uh, that rate of gain will be over, I'd say, about a 20 to 25-year time period. In a broadleaf, it'll be over 40 to 50 years. So you're talking about the doubling of the of the time. So the sequestration rate is about half of that of conifers, but you know your cycle is much much longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, next question for everybody, I suppose, and a hey, it's asking really is it, is it better to incorporate incorporate straw or to use use it as a farmyard manure if you were if you had your own straw. And, and the option of farmyard manure? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I would say if you had the choice and you were really going to go down the road of FYM, I would actually put it into FYM. If you're not going to do that, I'd incorporate it into the soil. So there's the answer. Michaela, do you want to comment? Or? No, not an additional dad there. Like 
especially if it's a mixed enterprise farm, you know, having that straw within your, your own farm system and not having to buy any, any additional emissions has massive benefits. And then you're also utilizing it um, in terms of soil, organic carbon, adding that back in. Yeah, yeah. Simon, I, where are you on that one? Yeah, um, farm yard manure, I think, um, every day. Um, yeah, I suppose that you get additional nutrient benefit, I guess, and, and also you know, additional composting in that. You know, once it goes in fresh, it has to be broken down as, as straw. So the strong corporation has its benefits, but I think as, as a farm yard manure, um, and, and particularly as a, as a composted farm yard manure, um, the benefits are significantly greater, I would say. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. It depends on how you treat it. So if you compost it, you're going to get a much greater benefit than if you put it in fresh. Yeah, because if you put it in fresh, all it's going to do is tie up nitrogen. You know, so so you're going to have a problem with that. Um, and then of course the other thing, I, I, like I would say, the main thing, if I was a farmer, that I would say to to any farmer is get your soil pH right first. And everything else flows from there. And so, when you say compost, basically that's that's storing for a year, I suppose. Is that right? For the next season? Yeah, it's 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 storing for for it's it's, it's storing and aerating uh, that that manure for a, for a period of time. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So what it does is it turns the the carbon that's that's more easily lost into carbon that's much more stays in the soil for much more longer. Yeah. Hey, and, and another question here for you, Gary. Hey, is there potential for changes in tillage to include cover crops and straw incorporation to, to shift the, the soil biome to yeah, more? Absolutely. If you're in a if you're in a string production a spring barley production system, for example. Um, or any sort of spring crop production system, I would advocate cover crops, absolutely, um, to reduce your, your winter losses. Um, if, you're, if you're in a, a, a rotation system, certainly introducing grass lays, we found, has produced, um, you know, actually delivers a real benefit. Um, uh, and certainly strong corporation, We've, we've seen, Rothamsted have seen, AFB has seen, uh, uh, produces uh, tangible results, like, uh, like real benefits, about a 10 to 15% increase in the amount of carbon sequestered. So, so, so strong cooperation for spring crops, uh, sorry, cover crops for spring crops, strong cooperation, um, uh, a move to no-till and uh, introduction of grass lays, I think are the, is the menu. For, for arable systems. Yeah, thank you. Michaela or Simon, do you, you want to add anything there? No. We'll, we'll, we'll take silence as a note. Uh, now, uh, the, the, well, this is asked for Guy again, but I think it's for everybody really. Should all livestock farms that have suitable soil have an area of cereals to improve their carbon foot, footprint? And would this not have a big overall effect on carbon footprint? on agriculture as a whole? They could, depending on where their concentrate is coming from. So, so that's the big thing. Where is our protein coming from? And where is the rest of their concentrate coming from? If they're coming from countries that are denuding tropical rainforest or putting in GMO, then absolutely it should be produced. And I would say it should absolutely be produced locally, either by tillage farmers or by, by livestock farmers themselves. Um, so, so that will have a, a, a huge influence on the, uh, on the carbon footprint of both dairy and beef. So absolutely. Yeah, Michaela. Yeah, and you know, for anybody considering it, it would be very important to look at the efficiency of that system that they're planning to put in because there's no point in including an arable rotation within the farm if there is inefficiencies in it and the likes of fertilizers and that are actually contributing more to that greenhouse gas emission of the whole farm. So it's just important that if you are planning to do that, to look at it and ensure it's as efficient as possible because inefficient systems can have a very negative effect on the whole farm emission. Yeah. Simon, do you want to comment? 
Um, I suppose I tend to think about this a little bit wider, and, and um, I suppose I, I supply a, a few local producers, I supply a pig farmer, um, and the way I look at it is I, I grow grain well, he grows pigs well. If we start, I mean, for me, a mixed system is a regional system. If I supply somebody within five miles, is, is that a mixed farming area that we're in? Mm -hmm. um, if I was then to take maybe in the future manure back or or we actually integrated the, the, the sort of regional system, uh, regional, uh, not say regional, the local um, system, could we have the same output? And if I supply grain and, and that could include protein crops, uh, does that then impact um, his carbon footprint? Um, can we can we share that out and, and be more, I suppose, more dynamic um, in a in a small area that we have in Northern Ireland? Can can we can we try and be more in, integrated and you know, rather than everybody saying mixed farming as the, as the sort of silver bullet? Why don't we look at a mixed farming region uh, where we actually support each other? And I suppose I maybe that's a wider view of it, but um, I tend to think if we do something well, why not keep doing that well and and try and support each other? But well, surely, surely, Simon, you're actually decreasing the carbon footprint of the pig farm that you're supplying because you're supplying, you know, you're supplying nutrients at a much lower carbon cost than they might be farming it in from. Yeah. Well, well that's, that's what I would view. And, and I mean, the fact that I'm also a leaf farm, um, surely I'm giving him environmental credentials in the green that he's using as well. So, you know, but, but until we sort of join that up and, and actually give those credits where they're, where they're, I suppose they're due and, and, and that encourages um, other users to, to sort of enter those sort of systems, um, you know, we may not get there, but I, I certainly think there is um, a lot of potential in those sort of systems. Yep. Thank you for that. The, the next question, and, and I'll put this to you first, Simon, because I'm, I'm not sure whether you are a mint hill or not, but the, the question is, would mint hill not be a big help in reducing your carbon footprint to net zero due to less passes over the ground and less demand for diesel? Yeah, I mean, Mintel is something that I've, I've looked at and we do a bit of sort of, I suppose, almost Mintel on, on some of our ground, depending on what crop we're following, but in the main, we're, we're ply based. And, and I suppose that's on, on two reasons. Um, given where we are in our climate, um, we, we get a lot of weed pressure in Mintel systems. Um, we can also struggle to get on to the ground if it's wet in the back end, whereas the ply, we can ply over dry. And also integrating um, you know, compost or farmyard manures uh, is much better behind the plow. So I suppose it's a it's a, a sort of a trade off uh, in terms of you know the right system for the for the right area and and also the fact that we are applying organic matter. Um, I guess we we've got a, a trade off in there. But but yeah, look, I think there's no doubt that there the, the good good mental systems in the right places um, are, are certainly very very valuable when you're talking about carbon. Yeah. Michaela, have you have you car carbon audited the, the two different systems? Or if there is a well managed plow based system, it can be equally as as beneficial um, to to a poorly managed mintel system. And obviously, the weather is a massive determinant of it here in Northern Ireland. And there is, as Simon said, the many issues in in terms of creating that steel seedbed. Um, and then obviously the impact of maybe having to go in with additional sprays and, and things like that that have then those additional emissions. So it's very much a very fine line to sort of get that that sweet spot in terms of benefit from Mintil in in the Northern Ireland system at the minute um, with with the other uh, options that we have there. Yeah, I agree. Yes, Gary. Certainly, I've I've researched Mintil systems for twenty years now, and. Uh, the one thing I can say is that uh, it's it's a mixed bag. Um, so if you've got uh, if you've got an optimal field size and a minimum of headland and turning areas, then yes, mintail will help. But you know if you look at the average Irish uh, farm, be it north or south, the Irish the Irish field size, it's it's not really optimal. For for and um, you have grass weed invasions probably one out of every five years. Um, you you have marginal carbon benefits and negligible end well benefits. So so I would say Mintel, I'd say is at best 
you know, neutral from a carbon footprint point of view. Now, now no till and direct drilling is a probably a different matter, but certainly men tail, I, I wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, the, the jury is out and certainly uh, down south on soils that we've looked at and we've done an awful lot of research on this in terms of both the carbon and nitrogen balance. Um, it doesn't seem to really add up. Yep, thank you for that. The, the next question we'll, we'll give you all a go, a go at uh, and it asks, will there be incentives Reward or rewards for farms that are net zero or are in the process of becoming net zero com compared to other farms that aren't, aren't on that journey. Uh, Michaela, do you want to lead off on that one? Yeah, um, well, I suppose with policy development that's ongoing, there is potential for that. Um, but obviously the main focus with emissions in Northern Ireland has mainly been the livestock sector because it obviously is a major contributor. Um, so in terms of potential policy for the arable or tillage sector, I'm not sure that that is something that would happen in the short term, but there's obviously, you know, um, existing schemes in terms of the EFS, environmental farming schemes, things like that, where there is carbon benefits and people are getting supported. Uh, support from those and potentially those will be moved forward with future policy developments and uh, more scheme developments so it's very much up in the air and I can't I can't really comment on the on the tillage sector at this stage. Yes yeah, certainly from a European point of view I'm fairly sure that um, that that best best agricultural practice uh, from a tillage basis will be will be rewarded Absolutely. Um, depends on what is done across the cap and, and how, that, uh, how that impacts on Northern Ireland is, is, is probably um, uh, something that we don't know. Um, but certainly across the, across the European Union, um, uh, there's, there's a healthy appetite to uh, reward good farming carbon practices. Absolutely. I'm sure we saw that we talked to the to DG Climate today and they they're they're very, very enthusiastic on it. Yeah. Simon, do you want to like do you see advantages like outside your farm gate for a bit your arc zero involvement? Yeah, I suppose I mean there's there's a lot of a lot of talk and and, and you know perhaps a bit of a gold rush at the minute for for carbon and carbon credits and what's everything worth and, and i think for, for me it's early days i think i think the first step is to actually understand um what what our carbon impact is where we can mitigate and then i suppose make sure that that's verifiable and that we can actually stand behind that uh, if we do then if, if a market does exist or does does become at the minute there isn't really um, anywhere that you could potentially trade that, I think there are people trying to hoover up assets, um, you know, outside of agri agri food, um, which I think is is um, not in the interests of, of of us as farmers at this stage. So I think um, what I suppose I'm trying to do, um, as one of one of the things I'm trying to do, I suppose in our zero is, is to actually get a get a verifiable um, baseline that we can we can actually. Um, you know, if there is a market that we can actually then go and take that forward and at least say that we have something, but at the minute to say that we had uh, carbon to sell, I don't, I'm not sure what, what you could actually say that is at the minute. But, but I think, in fairness, you guys have the best of both worlds. So you can go within the European system or the UK system. You can take your choice and, and work out which one is the best for, for, for what you want to do. And cer certainly within the EU system, and, and they're, they're very cognizant, Simon, of what you're saying, is, is to be very, very careful about how, how this stuff is measured, verified, and reported. Absolutely. But, but I would say, in terms of Northern Ireland, you've got a, you've got a big opportunity that you can, you can actually get probably the best of both worlds the EU system and the UK system. Yep, Th thanks for that. Hey, both the next one, Michael, is for you and is asking, is there any specific weakness in these carbon calculators or when, when they're played in the Northern Ireland scenario? 
Uh, no, not specifically for Northern Ireland, but there are a number of weaknesses across all calculators, and it's a very emerging science in terms of um, there's a number of commercial benefits for companies to develop these, and there are obviously freely available ones um, online. But the main weaknesses with them is that transparency of the emission factors that they are using. Um, and as Simon had highlighted, AgriCalc is using a, a tier one figure for, for their soil sequestration. Ideally, you know, in a, in a perfect world, that would be a tier two figure. But the information is maybe not available or is very difficult to interpret. So I would say that's that's the, the biggest weakness with calculators is that transparency of the, the fact the emission factor that's being applied and why it's being applied. Which, and, which, um, which available. Is yeah, which is why we use we use the firm the, the the cool firm tool. So we can we can actually modulate that to our own system and 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 that's difficult for benchmarking, you know, from different different countries because you're comparing different you're comparing apples and oranges. Um, you know, but for, and, and for Michaela, it's it's probably uh, very, very difficult. Um, but then if you're if you're dealing with with Caffrey, then if you're dealing with tier one across the board, then it makes it much easier. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. It, if somebody's using one calculator, we can't make direct comparisons then with um, another calculator. And that, that's another weakness with them. But obviously, it's a commercial business. and We have to work with the tools that are available out there and they will develop as, as obviously this is a major topic and it's growing in, in popularity with, within policy. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for that. And uh, uh, our, our, time, our time is gone, so we'll sort of wind up. There's one, there's one question, and it's not strictly arable, but it, it's quite, uh, has the potential to be quite contentious, I suppose. And, and, I, and I would remind you, Simon, that you, you are being recorded. But the, the question is, what's your, what's your view on, on how the Six Nations is going to go this year? <laughs> <laughs> That's more, more more steady ground for me maybe now on that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, let's, uh, I just just like on behalf of everybody that's joined in tonight, th thank all three of for <clears throat> it's been hugely informative and, and interesting. And uh, 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 thank you most sincerely. Uh, we're, uh, I'd like to remind our, our all, all this attend of the online survey at the end, if you just take a minute and, uh, to, to, to fill that in. And in closing, remind you all that uh, this night next week on the 8th, where the second uh, webinar takes place, and that, that will be chaired by Bruce Steele from Ulster Arbo Society. And the, the speakers on that occasion will Pete Berry uh, from ADAS, Roma Gwynn from uh, a bio pesticide specialist, Sarah Bell, who farms and runs a consultancy business, and Bruce himself, who's an agronomist and agriculture merchant with heading on for 40 years' experience. So it should be another useful and interesting night. So thank you all for attending. And once again, thank you to Gary, uh, Michaela, and Simon. Thank you very much and good night. And thank you, William. Thank you, William. Yeah. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye.